Welcome, everyone. This is the Open Mainframe Summit presentation, No Compromise, Safeguarding Your Mainframe Software Supply Chain. I'm joined today by Marianne Furno, Senior Security Manager uh, in the Broadcom Mainframe Software Division. And I'm Greg McKinnon. I'm an architect also in the Mainframe uh, Software Division at Broadcom. Now, uh, what we're gonna talk about today is software supply chains, uh, related attacks, how all that relates to the mainframe and step software vendors and customers can take to uh, enhance uh, software integrity and ensure that the software is safe to use. Yeah, so Greg, we're gonna start this off by looking at the traditional supply chain, which we're all so uh, aware of because it, it gives us tangible items that we need in everyday life. And our supply chain is an entire network of people and distribution services and all the organizations and resources and activities that go to distributing those environments. So you can see when we have a problem in here, it's no different than our IT world where we could be playing whack-a-mole and trying to figure out where the problem is. And when you stop a fire over here, you got another one brewing over here. And um, I thought a good parallel to this in, in securing this was to look back in history and say, were there ever problems with the tangible supply chains and manufacturing? And, you know, not to open this up on a dark and gloomy topic, but I live in the Chicagoland area and back in the early 80s, uh, Johnson & Johnson had one of their um, Tyl uh, one of their products, in this case, Tylenol compromised in the supply chain. And what happened was, is somebody along the way was tainting the Tylenol capsules with some cyanide. And it ultimately led to the death of seven people in the Chicagoland area. But as Johnson & Johnson tried to figure out how this happened, it ultimately, uh, police figured out that all seven had in common, they had ingested Tylenol prior to their death. They then had to go through this entire supply chain and figure out where the product was compromised. And so it, it very much parallels the world that we live in today. And we'll come back to this example because, um, you know, even though it's dark and gloomy and, and some deaths ensued, ultimately some positives came out of that. So we're, we'll finish on that example and bring it back to you. Okay, and um, a traditional supply chain uh, delivering tangible products like Tylenol, as Marianne just described, is, is very similar to the software supply chain and delivering digital assets. The patterns are the same and the basic idea is the same and indeed some of the problems are, are similar. In terms of the process, each takes raw materials, inputs, combines them in some way, transforms them, and ultimately delivers a product or solution to a consumer. Now, these supply chains also have something else in common that Marianne alluded to. They're, they're both prone to attack. And as, as Marianne points out, we've seen examples of traditional supply chains being disrupted. And there has been an increase in cyber attacks against software supply chains over the recent years. And the question is, what, what can we do to mitigate these attacks and guard against them? Now, these, in, the increase in these software supply chain attacks have been serious enough that it provided some impetus for a federal U.S. executive order uh, on cybersecurity. And uh, uh, these attacks, uh, they really look to compromise uh, some uh, things specific to the software process. They can attack the raw materials like uh, your first party source repo. It could be uh, third party dependencies, could be the processes you use like the build process, for example, your tool chain, the environment hosting your build, things like that, among other things. And a key characteristic common to all these is that it's an upstream attack that benefits from a scaled out uh, impact downstream in terms of the damage that's done. So an upstream attack, scaled out exploitation and damage downstream. And, and what we have here 
just for a couple of examples of some high, high profile cases, the bottom right uh, of the chart is the not Petya uh, cyber attack on a software supply chain. In this case, some accounting software was compromised and this compromised accounting software went out in a software update. Now, a couple of companies that were really impacted by this were Merck and the Maersk shipping company. The Maersk global shipping lines ground to a halt as a result of this attack. And the way it worked is the compromised software went out in an update, this accounting software, and the malicious code mucked around with the master boot records. So when a machine was recycled, shut down, it would never reboot. Uh, this was a devastating uh, consequence for companies around the world and uh, Maersk as a prime example. Uh, the other example here, SolarWinds, uh, is, is a case where the build process was, was infiltrated and hacked. The infiltrators were able to determine when a build was going to start, and they would slip malicious code in at the very last moment, getting that code packaged with the software that was going to go, go out in the next release, unbeknownst to anybody. It went undetected. And this malicious code uh, basically, when installed on a customer's machine, uh, had a backdoor that would allow uh, spyware to be installed. So this was also a, a very serious outcome. And so serious damage in both cases. And again, the question is, how can we mitigate this? How can we guard against this sort of cyber attack on our software supply chains? Okay, software supply chain security, uh, we believe really relies on something we're calling a software supply chain integrity model. And there are two key aspects. One is transparency and the other verifiable integrity. Now transparency here means that it, uh, you want to provide visibility into the software itself, like what's in the software, components, dependencies, uh, related vulnerability, stuff like that, but also transparency and visibility into the processes that were used, how the software was constructed, tools that were used, and even the environment where the software is being built. All of this stuff has high value, both for uh, software producers and consumers, because the more visibility you have, the more understanding you have, uh, the less risk you face. It decreases risk and can help mitigate some of these attacks we've talked about. But this visibility, the, the, the information that will provide this transparency is only as good as it is, as it is trustworthy. And that's where the verifiable integrity piece comes in. You need to protect this information and make sure that with high confidence, you can trust what it's telling you, what it's showing to you. And you can achieve that through something called an attestation. And we'll look at both aspects uh, over the next couple of charts. Now, as I mentioned, there are a number of things that you'd like to make more visible, you'd like to have more transparency into the software itself, the build processes, how the software is constructed, the environment, the tools, stuff like that, the various piece, piece parts that make up your software supply chain, your pipeline environment. But what we'll focus on here is just a prime example of the benefits of this sort of transparency is the software bill of materials or SBOM. Now, You'll notice on the lower left, the red rectangles. This is our friend that uh, uh, Marianne introduced, Tylenol. And what we see here is the uh, label from a Tylenol package. And it's got all sorts of good stuff on there, active ingredients, inactive ingredients, drug facts, directions, how to use it, warning, stuff like that. But it essentially uh, is telling you what's in these Tylenol caplets. And that's very important. So you can decide as a consumer whether it, hey, it's safe to use this stuff or not, you know? And, but as Marianne points out, uh, you know, having a product that perhaps is labeled is insufficient. You need to make sure you can trust what's on this label. Um, otherwise it's, it's, it's useless and could be dangerous. If you, if you rely on the label that these are the ingredients and it's got something else in there, uh, as Marianne uh, described, then that can be lethal. Uh, in, in the case of a, a over-the-counter drug, but it could also be very, uh, uh, you know, dangerous and disruptive if it's, if it's software. So just like a bill of materials is to 
traditional manufacturing telling you what's in the package and the Tylenol label is the Tylenol, you know, for an over-the-counter drug. The S-bomb is to software. And it basically uh, tells you what's in the software. It decreases risk. Now, as I was saying before, uh, the visibility and transparency is, is very important. It decreases risk. It tells you what's in there. But you have to be able to trust the information. And that's where an attestation comes into play. An attestation is a structured signed piece of metadata that lets you wrap and protect certain pieces of information. And you cryptographically sign it to provide the protection. Now, you get that from a signed piece of data generally. Uh, you know, you cryptographically sign something, you can detect forgery or whether something's been tampered with. But with an attestation, you can additionally make statements or claims about it as well, which imbues it with some meaning that and it makes itself descriptive and that can be useful in compliance and auditing use cases and you can see some prime examples here of things you might want to uh, have verifiable proof about that you want to know that is what you're looking at is reliable and trustworthy and s bombs a prime example provenance is another uh, piece of data you might want to protect around you know how software uh, was was constructed uh, environmental, you might want to capture some details about the environment where the build's being done, the processes that are being used, code review, policy decisions, stuff like that. And if you see something, uh, if you discover you have something in your own organization that you can't see a good example for, you can use the same Salsa and Toto attestation model to invent a new one. Now here's just a really quick uh, example. You can see our friend Tylenol in the upper right hand corner now sporting a tamper proof uh, cap and seal. And really that's what a signed attestation is akin to. It's like a tamper proof cap and seal on something. And in this case, you've got the open source tool SIFT on the upper left, I'm familiar to most of you people, I would imagine. And it is fetching or, or pulling a container image from a registry, generating an SBOM and an attestation using that same attestation model we saw on the previous page, supply chain levels for software artifacts model or SALSA. And then using six door cosine, which is another open source tool out there for securing software, familiar to you all, I'm sure. And it's providing the cryptographic signature to protect the attestation. It's put back in the registry. The consumer later pulls the attestation, can tell it hasn't been tampered with because it's got the tamper proof uh, seal and cap, the, the, the signature, it's signed, and then can trust the SBOM information as if it's the label on the software. The, the consumer knows it hasn't been tampered with, can trust the ingredients list, and can therefore trust what's in the actual container image to run that image in their environment. So how does this relate to the mainframe? I mean, like many from the mainframe world, I would be very ready and, and apt to say the mainframe is probably the most highly securable platform on the planet. And yet it's not invulnerable to cyber attack. Nothing is really. And, you know, a software supply chain security models, a software supply chain security implementation is essential to safeguarding uh, mainframe su uh, supply chain, software supply chains, just as they are uh, on any other environment in any, uh, on any other platform. And, you know, this provides the transparent assurance that uh, software, uh, you know, produced using a software supply chain that's hosted on the mainframe has integrity and is safe to use. Mm -hmm. Greg, I always like your dialogue around the upstream, downstream. I think that it just really tells the tale of how impactful it could be. You have one point of compromise and then, you know, it just explodes from there and can be so impactful. Mm -hmm. But you, yes. I think yeah. the good news in here is, as you mentioned, you know, we've got the most securable platform here with the mainframe and, um, but we need to pay attention to it and we need to make sure that we are applying best practices and following those so that our critical workloads and the software that's being created in the supply chains that mainframe are a part of that ecosystem stay secure. So from a, a mainframe 
security best practices in a hybrid IT world, we can summarize this as some very high level areas to look at. The first is vulnerability management. Of course, we all know this, keeping your software up to date, and you can do that pretty easily. Um, Different vendors, including ourselves, we send out notifications when there's an integrity fix that's available or something that uh, affects security. And so it's no different from any other platform in that case is you've got to keep your, your software up to date and current and make sure you're plugging any holes that are found. The second is looking at security configuration and make sure you're following the vendor security technical implementation guidance that's available for many products that you have in your environments. Uh, they'll give you best practices for and the guidance that is needed to configure those in a secure manner. We also put enabling multi-factor authentication under the security configuration to ensure that it is configured so that the folks that you are allowing access to this most critical system are required to use multi-factor and you can trust who they say they are so that you you know don't hit integrity problems down the line because they've gotten access to something or someone who you don't know has gotten access to something. Another area is your data protection. So data as well as I'll call IP and source code falls under underneath this. Make sure that you can classify and that you can control who has access to the different data points and make that very granular and um, monitor that access to the data as well so that you can see who and when and look for those anomalies when they're occurring either anomalies in terms of the access or anomalies in terms of data movement in particular off the platform access control is is probably the linchpin and the underpinning of everything but making sure that you've got limited access to critical uh, libraries data applications all of that make sure that you're looking at uh, baselines and when folks are doing things that they shouldn't be doing and as they move from role to role all of that is kept current and uh, recertification efforts are really assisted by doing these items because then all the garbage is weeded out and you're asking your your business units to focus on the true access and is that needed going forward the next area was privileged user management and so this goes in with many of the other areas here but making sure you trust the identity. And, and someone made a comment the other day that was interesting. They said, well, if I'm gonna let a privileged user on the environment and I'm gonna control and monitor them, I better be darn sure I know who they are. And so they looked at the multi-factor and the privileged user control going hand in hand. Um, I will add that, you know, making sure that least privilege model is followed as well as just in time access, because there's no point in having somebody have that on their ID all the time. It shouldn't be compromised. Then they can get to more than than what's uh, more than they could if it was just benign access. I would just interject one thing there, Mary, and I think that that's all very important. It's uh, it provides that really strong security posture, that strong foundation you need for software supply chain security to even be viable. But what you just mentioned about least privileged access, I think that that's, that's especially relevant here. You really wanna ensure that's what you do with your supply chain environments. Among all this other stuff, that one just really resonated. So I, yes. I appreciated hearing it, yeah. yeah. And then to, f to finish out the privileged users, just auditing so that, um, you know, when you look at different models today that are implemented for security, including zero trust, which we'll see in a moment, that, you know, one of the third tenants there is that assume a breach. So auditing, and, and then that goes with continuous monitoring of system events in general, ensuring that you have that data in hindsight to look at should something happened on the system, then you can go in there, you have audit, uh, or you've got your forensic trail to look at, uh, in particular against the privileged users and monitoring of system critical infrastructure, some of your data sets to IPL your systems, some of the data sets that you've found that have your IP in them or regulated data, and then certainly those that are involved with the supply chain and your, um, your life cycle there. Mm -hmm. Uh, can I just add one thing about forensic trail? Do you mind? Yeah, uh, absolutely. You know, I, I think that uh, that's another important point. I think it's all important, but that one again resonates in that you know, the attestations we're talking about, I mean, they're really geared 
to provide that sort of trustworthy, secured forensic trail that complements and enhances this because they're meant to provide that, you know, that sort of history that, as you put it so nicely, forensic trail that can be used to drive compliance, you know, auditing, uh, uh, reporting, and, you know, policy automation. So a lot of really uh, uh, great utility that comes out of the attestations and, and, and especially around that forensic trail that you described so well. Yeah. Yeah. So this this might seem a lot, it might seem overwhelming to some, but let us kind of boil it down for you and look at some paths that others have taken, which makes it an implementation, one, that's fairly easy to do, and two, gets organizations into a really good security posture um, to protect their most critical assets. So. We see a start with, let us adopt those best practices. Let us validate where we're at today. Maybe look at some health checks, look at environmental information and compare what is our current state against those best practices and wrap their arms around that, including the patch management piece. Do I have notifications? Am I getting um, my my system in a state where it needs to be and doing that continuously, not just point in time. The second piece we touched upon as well, and, and I go back to that comment again, if you're gonna let folks on your system, you better be sure you know who they are. Now, some folks had said in the past that, well, I have, I'm multi-factoring into my network, but we know that network boundary is kind of dissolving. And so now the focus is, I need to multi-factor into the application that I'm that is my goal. And if my application is my source code management system, is my tools to build, I need to make sure that I'm trusting the identity of folks that are coming in there. The database hygiene lends itself to a lot of the least privilege so that I, I'm not over provisioned. I haven't carried entitlements around from role to role and all of that is cleaned out of my database so that users, I, I absolutely, is very tight window of what they can access and when. And then that flows also into a subset of those users and that's the privileged user management, making sure I'm giving them just in time access to the environments that they need, including the tooling and the source code and everything that's in the software supply chain. And lastly is the continuous monitoring piece and ensuring that all of that auditing is taking place. I'm capturing continuous monitoring. If I'm forwarding that and putting it into my SIM tools so that it's intermixed with enterprise events, wonderful. If I'm using it for other purposes in my environment, uh, a data lake or putting it into a warehouse, wonderful as well. But these are five simple steps here to, to get folks into a better security posture in the mix of all of these items. And, um, you know, this is a prescribed path that we've, we've seen many, many organizations walk through. And the good thing here is it's implementing a lot of automation along the way as well, so that you can have uh, your security folks, some of their time freed up then to focus on making sure and double back and setting strategic security projects in place. So we mentioned at the start of the presentation that we did have some positive outcomes, even though we kind of started with a, a dark uh, subject line here with the Tylenol kind of uh, being an example of really working to secure the software supply chain. And we paralleled it back to the tangible supply chain. But another couple parallels come out of this. In Johnson & Johnson ended this, and Greg alluded to um, he paralleled the attestation for the software and the SBOM with the ingredient list as well as the tamper resistant cap. They put an outer seal and an inner seal on this and usually a, a third place is the box is sealed uh, on the shelf in the store as well. And one would think of, ooh, just like we get brand damage today when things happen to our organization and, you know, solar winds and the examples that Greg brought up, those organizations suffered during that time period. Johnson & Johnson actually came out of the, the whole 80s ahead of where they were. Their market share went up, their stock price went up. And when folks investigated that, they said, you know what? Johnson & Johnson acted with honesty and transparency. They were prompt and aggressive in their attention to the manner. And 
Lastly, they were cross-functional in terms of working with the local authorities as well as the FBI to get all this together. So sounds kind of familiar to our environments. We have to work from business lines to the security department, make sure we're all understanding these things, um, DevOps involved, uh, a whole ecosystem here in order to make sure that we stay into a secure state. And I think you know, with the Tylenol example, it's very, it's a reactive story that we're looking at. Something happened here that causes change for the greater good at the end. In our case today, we've seen a few examples of supply chains getting hit in the world, but largely we can have a proactive story today and we can work to make sure that we maintain the, the security of our environment. So Greg, any last words uh, before we wrap up? Um, I, I don't, think so other than to say that I I, uh, I think that uh, uh, this the this strong security underpinnings you described you know are essential to, to supporting a, a robust software supply chain and security model so they, they really go hand in glove to to provide that kind of uh, assurance that we you know we want to provide and, and be proactive in providing it as you as you described. Yeah, yeah, and I, th I think a lot of that comes to communicating as well and making sure that all parties involved are are in the loop and uh, continue that open dialogue. I guess we're in a, a great state. We've got a lot of opportunity. And we thank you for joining us today. Uh, Greg and I were happy to host this meeting. And please reach out if you have any questions. Thank yes, you. Please do. Thank you.